This video is sponsored by Rail and Road Auction House, the Midwest's only dedicated home for transportation memorabilia. Give yourself a chance to own a piece of history by attending one of their upcoming online auctions. Register to bid by downloading the new Rail and Road app on your Apple or Android device or visit rarauctions.com to join in on the fun. Whether you're new to the hobby or are a lifelong Railroadiana collector, Rail and Road has something for everyone. From porcelain to paper and signs to speeders, Rail and Road Auction House is the place to find your railroad treasure. Welcome to the Motor City. On the morning of May 25th, 2023, we were on location in Pole Town to document a really short short line, the Detroit Connecting Railroad. Known by locals as the Decon, it's just two and a half miles long and is one of five short lines owned and operated by the Adrian and Blissfield Railroad Company. It caters to Detroit's Eastern Market and the Milwaukee Junction District, an industrial area about five miles north of downtown. It serves as a crucial link for its customers, interchanging with Canadian National at East Yard in Hamtramck. At 8.30, we watched as the crew pulled away from the makeshift yard office, a 40-foot intermodal container, to begin their day of switching. <laughs> As of this recording, the Decon serves three customers, U.S. Ecology, Vesco, and Ferris Processing and Trading. The railroad operates roughly twice a week, with employees sometimes driving from other ADBF properties, depending on who is rested. The Decon is the ADBF's second shortest railroad, with the other being the Lapeer Industrial, which is barely over a mile long. While it may be short, the Detroit Connecting is a busy little railroad. They operate as needed, so if you're lucky enough to catch them, you'll be in for a full day of switching. On this day, the crew began by pulling loads south from a nearby storage track to U.S. Ecology, a Republic Services company. U.S. Ecology's Detroit South location is situated at 1923 Frederick Street and serves as a hazardous waste storage and treatment facility. The Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy licensed U.S. Liquids Incorporated to operate the site in 2003. The facility changed ownership a year later when the Environmental Quality Company acquired it from U.S. Liquids. Subsequently, U.S. Ecology assumed control of the EQ company in 2014, maintaining ownership and operation of the site since then. 
The facility offers essential treatment services for hazardous and non-hazardous liquids, solids, sludges, and debris. Once in the clear, the crew shoved back and tied onto the loads before pulling the entire train ahead to clear the switch. With the empties on the bottom, they could be shoved into the customer's loading track. These tank cars are used to transport toxic liquids to U.S. Ecology, where they are empty. The liquids are either treated and recycled, or are disposed of on site.
In addition to industrial switching and interchange service, the Detroit Connecting Railroad has transload capabilities, allowing for the efficient transfer of products from truck to rail and vice versa. Additionally, there is a team track available for various operations. Rail car storage is also offered to accommodate the needs of businesses. Moreover, the short line is located near major highways such as I-75, I-94, and downtown Detroit, enabling convenient transportation connections for transload customers. The railroad uses a General Electric 44-tonner and an EMD SW900 to pull and switch cars on the industrial spur. Number 836 was built in November of 1953 for the Chicago, Rock Island and Pacific, which it served for 27 years. It was later acquired by Checker Motors as their number one. If you're not familiar, Checker was known as the manufacturer of the iconic taxi cab for just shy of 90 years. In 2007, the ADBF acquired the number one and repainted the switcher into CN passenger colors with New York Central style lettering and stripes. It has served on the Decon for nearly 15 years and still looks great, even though the paint is beginning to fade. Time will tell if this little green engine will be repainted into the A&B's new paint scheme, a livery that has been affectionately nicknamed the Quality Dairy Scheme after a local convenience store chain around the Lansing area.
After switching at U.S. Ecology, the train crew then worked Vesco oil. This customer receives loads of lube oil and methanol. The decon also leaves them empties that are marked as saying CRKCS draining. Founded in 1947, the company offers lubricants, metalworking products, fluid exchange systems, antifreeze, greases, gear oils, and hydraulics. Vesco Oil serves industrial, automotive, retailers, and related industries. The company's Detroit warehouse happens to be its largest and serves markets as far as Port Huron, Ann Arbor, and Northern Ohio. Vesco's filter processing operations are based here, utilizing a crusher unit that can process more than 20,000 filters per day. The oil company's primary mineral spirits recycling center is also located at this facility, with the capacity to process almost 2,000 gallons daily. As the central purchasing location for the corporation, the product is transferred to Vesco's remote locations daily, providing just-in-time inventory for its customer base. Located right next to Vesco is Ferris Processing and Trading, one of North America's premier processors, sellers, and recyclers of scrap metals. Established in 1904 as Sam Allen & Sons in Pontiac, Michigan, FPT's growth has been marked by strategic acquisitions and pioneering initiatives. From acquiring TBS Recycling and Zaliv Brothers to opening locations in Detroit Ypsilanti and Inkster, FPT has solidified its position as Michigan's largest ferrous and non-ferrous metals recycler. The company's innovative milestones include installing the world's first super heavy-duty shredder in 1986 and pioneering the fully automated non-ferrous metals processing facility in Warren, Michigan back in 2001. FPT currently processes approximately 3 million tons of scrap per year. In November 2021, the Cleveland Cliffs Corporation, a leading iron ore mining company with a focus on supplying raw materials to the North American steel industry, acquired Ferris Processing and Trading. Cleveland Cliffs expects to grow its prime scrap presence through FPT's existing relationships 
with industrial steel consumers. On this day, the decon crew repositioned cars for FPT and picked up a loaded gondola of processed metal for delivery to Canadian National at East Yard nearby. Decon began operations on February 1, 1999, after purchasing two and a half miles of the original Grand Trunk Western Main Line from parent company CN. Historically, it was one of Michigan's first railroads, built by the Detroit and Pontiac between 1834 and 1838. It was also the primary passenger route to Brush Street Station along the Detroit River for over 100 years.
The Decon connects with CN at Milwaukee Junction, a Detroit railfan hotspot that also sees Conrail and Amtrak trains. CN's Shoreline, Holly, and Mount Clemens subdivisions connect here, with Amtrak Wolverine service utilizing the Holly to reach its terminal station in Pontiac. Norfolk Southern and CSX locomotives are common at Milwaukee Junction, as Conrail trains use motive power from their parent companies. After seeing the Decon take the connection track for East Yard, we also saw this northbound CN Freight that was about to take the Holly Sub. What made it notable was the third unit, a BC rail painted GE-9 with unique features like the front facing bell mounted between its number boards, the signature teardrop style cab windows, and the addition of Canadian rock lights. Also, note the active red DPU light on the lead locomotive, ES44AC2895. These lights are typically used on CN locomotives that act as distributed power on the rear of trains. Following the implementation of positive train control, which led to the death of many older locomotive classes, these days it's rare to see such motive power variety on Class 1 railroads. That's why we opted for another shot of the train to the north of Milwaukee Junction.
at CN's East Yard, we caught up with the decon crew after they had dropped off their cars for the Class 1 railroad. They did a little switching before departing the yard with their inbounds. Until February 25, 2005, CN interchanged with the decon at the nearby Ferry Yard. After that, the interchange was shifted to the BOC Yard just outside the GM Hamtramck assembly plant. Four years later, on May 26, 2009, the decon began interchanging at East Yard.
If you're wondering how Milwaukee Junction, a railroad interlocking in Michigan, got its name, well, here's a little history lesson for you. The name originates from the defunct Detroit and Milwaukee Railroad, a company formed in 1855 by consolidating the struggling Detroit and Pontiac with the Oakland and Ottawa Railroad. Five years later, it was acquired by the Great Western Railway, a Canadian company. After entering receivership in 1875, Great Western acquired the railroad in 1878, refinanced its debts, and renamed it the Detroit, Grand Haven, and Milwaukee. The new company operated a 189-mile line from Detroit to Grand Haven along Lake Michigan's eastern shore. In 1882, it came under the ownership of the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada, formally consolidating with the Grand Trunk Western Railroad in 1928. When Grand Trunk Western was formed, a 26-stall roundhouse was built at the northeast quadrant of Milwaukee Junction. All but one stall, the former machine shop, was torn down during the summer of 1961. What little remained of the roundhouse was closed on January 11, 1987, about the time the BOC yard opened. The final part of the building was demolished on December 17, 2002. Before the Great Depression, Detroit's east side was home to over 400 industries, leading to traffic congestion due to the city's layout and extensive rail network. In 1923, Detroit and the Grand Trunk collaborated on a plan to build 22 grade separations, with both sharing the costs. Among the regraded tracks was one paralleling St. Aubin, which served major factories and terminated at Brush Street Station downtown. 16 crossings, including the Chestnut Street Bridge, were completed by March 1930 with the newly opened route called the Dequinder Line named so for Antoine de Quinder, a heroic soldier known for his conduct in the War of 1812. Later on, train crews nicknamed it the Dinky Line. As a result of the new cut through downtown, Grand Trunk Western began operating commuter trains between Detroit and Pontiac on August 1, 1931. By 1968, the trunk operated six daily commuter trains, the average daily ridership was 2,800, leading it to contemplate increasing fares or canceling the trains altogether. Both options would require the approval of the Michigan Public Service Commission. By 1971, Grand Trunk estimated yearly losses were exceeding $241,000. The coming of Amtrak and the end of most private sector intercity passenger trains was just about three weeks away, but commuter trains were considered separate entities and remained in private operation after May 1, 1971. In response to the issues facing Metro Detroit's fractured regional transit systems, namely busing, the Michigan Legislature enacted the Metropolitan Transportation Authorities Act of 1967, establishing SEMTA. Starting January 2, 1974, SEMTA began subsidizing one-third of the trunk's commuter train losses, increasing to two-thirds in 1977. In 1975, service included three rush hour trips between Pontiac and Detroit. The SEMTA route ran from Detroit to Pontiac, paralleling Woodward Avenue. Stops included Milwaukee Junction, Highland Park, Ferndale, Royal Oak, Birmingham, Bloomfield Hills, and Pontiac. The total distance covered was 26.3 miles. In 1978, SEMTA formally took over all passenger operations from Grand Trunk Western, 
rebranding locomotives and passenger cars thereafter. Despite SEMTA's attempts to expand its commuter rail network in the 70s and early 80s, these efforts face challenges in funding and political disagreements. Various transit plans were proposed, including rapid transit, bus rapid transit, people movers, and improved commuter rail to cities like Plymouth, Lansing, and Port Huron. However, SEMTA's commuter rail services were eventually discontinued in 1983 due to a $16 million budget shortfall. In 1994, Amtrak revived passenger rail service on much of the SEMTA route between Detroit and Pontiac, but bypassed the Dequinder Line since SEMTA's Renaissance Center station disappeared when the complex expanded eastward in the mid-80s. As a result of SEMTA's demise, the line south of Milwaukee Junction through Dequinder Cut became surplus, existing as a dead-end spur that served only a handful of remaining industries. By 1998, CN, Grand Trunk Western's parent company, began the process of selling off sections of the old passenger main. Adrian and Blissfield, through its Decon subsidiary, acquired a two and a half mile section, and by 2000, the remainder of the line through the actual cut was also sold. While the cut was abandoned, graffiti artists took over, vandalizing the many overpasses and concrete support walls. In 2003, the Greenways Initiative and grants totaling $3.4 million funded the transformation of the Dequinder Cut into a city-owned greenway, which opened in 2009 providing a 1.2-mile stretch for recreational use. Not long after the short line began operations, some rail fans started referring to it as the Decon Rat Line, thanks to many encounters with rodents that rivaled mid-sized canines. The infestation was due to the numerous meat processors operating in the vicinity. Back on Decon trackage, we caught the short train crossing Trombley Street. This is about the only location on the railroad where you can film the entire train running by your camera without it stopping to switch.
We caught up with the train below the I-94 overpass, where we observed the crew as they continued to switch. With about two more hours of switching to do, we opted for some mainline action and met up with our friend and photographer, Ken Borg, a well-known Motor City Rail fan. Well, hi, everybody. Hey, we're in Taylor, Michigan. Uh, just off of Monroe Boulevard here, we're about mile post 11 on the former Wabash, now Norfolk Southern. And we're waiting on Canadian Pacific trackage rights train 241. That's come out of that come out of Windsor through the tunnel. And this is a CP crew on this train, and he'll be running to Elkhart, change crews, CP men, and on to Chicago. Now, Ken, you've lived here for most of your life. Uh, what would you say is the best part about watching trains in Detroit? Well, we have the variety here. That's something you guys don't have. Because you figure, we've got CSX, we've got NS, we've got CN, we've got CP, and we got Amtrak. And down there we got the Delray Connecting, and we got Cliff Steel. And if you cross the border, you got Via Rail Canada. Can't go wrong with that. Where else can you go? And it's too bad. Now in the old days, across Southern Ontario, both the C, both the C and O, and the New York Central had tracks across Southern Ontario. Unbelievable. Now, Ken, uh, have you noticed a big change at all since the Canadian Pacific Kansas City merger? Yes, trains really are way off their schedule times. Though I see, we'll see on this train here. They've just picked up some aluminum ingot business, which they never had on this train before. And you were saying you haven't seen any KCS locomotives, really? No, I thought there'd be a mob, a plethora of KCS units, but no, very, no, there hasn't been. Huh. Well, let's get our first CP KC241. The old Wabash Main Line out of Detroit is one of the busiest lines in the state of Michigan, seeing roughly 12 trains per day between Norfolk Southern and CPKC, 
which utilizes trackage rights to Butler, Indiana. The route is a major automotive artery that provides the big three automakers with a direct connection to Kansas City, allowing for the shipment of brand new vehicles, frames, and auto parts between key assembly plants located along the line and beyond. comes out of Toronto and he's going to Chicago via Elkhart, Indiana. And when we saw the train leave, they went by C.P. Roberts. Now we have an eastbound Canadian Pacific train coming at us from C.P. Roberts. And this might be a C.P. 734 if he's got auto racks. We'll find out shortly. There's empty auto racks here for Southern Ontario, both for Windsor and probably St. Thomas and Oshawa. And uh, he's eastbound on a former Wabash. He'll be going into Oakwood Yard and then continuing on to Windsor. And we're at the Trolley Industrial Park. This industrial park was built in the 1960s jointly between Mayor Trolley, who was then the mayor of Taylor, Taylor, Michigan, and the Norfolk and Western Railroad. And at one time they had a crew dedicated to this place. Now I think there's just one customer in here. We'd like to thank Ken for being our guide to the Motor City, along with our friends Pete Mayer and Charles Galetsky Jr. for their expertise on the operations and history of the Detroit Connecting. Without them, 
this project would have been impossible. We'd also like to thank you, our viewer, for tuning in. Soon, we plan to produce more great coverage of Detroit's many railroads and look forward to sharing it with you. Until next time, happy railroading from all of us at Delay in Block Productions. So I guess you could say this industrial park was tailor-made. Yes, this was tailor-made in the city of Taylor, Michigan. <laughs> so uh, there's plenty of room for expansion here, not only in Taylor, but in the state of Michigan. Bring your factory here. And there's plenty of rail to serve you. Plenty of rail. CSX, Norfolk Southern, Canadian National, CPKC. You name it, we got it. Amtrak, over via rail in Canada. And we got uh, Delray Connecting located in the city of Delray. Plenty of industrial sites.